robot. I went over to Pixar. Um, Andrew, who's the uh, spoke, has, also has to be the spokesman, the, the, the man selling the movie to everybody, too, uh, gives a pitch for the movie. And he showed me um, maybe the part of the first act of the movie that he had put together on storyboards. And uh, then for the rest of it, he acted it out. He read from his script. He, he, he um, improv the rest of the movie, gave me a, a good feeling for the direction it was headed. And what he wanted, of course, was not only uh, sound design for the film, but, but more principally, he had all these major characters that were not going to have conventional uh, voices. There were not going to be many words in the film. And a lot of what they're thinking and feeling would have to be communicated with sound effects or, or expressive sounds that would be uh, stand in for dialogue. Huh? We also worked out through some animation tests early on. We put a string of sounds together. Uh, here's Wally driving in, boxing some trash up, and driving away. And I uh, would make, uh, cut together those sounds, and we'd give it to an animator. Yeah. The animator would then just, you know, uh, experiment with some, putting some action to it. And, and I, of course, I could see it, and I, I could immediately understand, oh my gosh, they can do so much with just the pose of a head or the angle of the binoculars. And, and uh, we worked back and forth with each character developing little video vignettes that, were, that gave everybody a chance. I call it sort of audio maquettes because everybody, animators, director, a team could look at it and say, oh yeah, this is how the autopilot probably will be made up. These are the components. Now you could, were free to you know, keep developing the story. But, but obviously with sound, we're very flexible. You, we can change sound up until the last day of the mix. No uh, lip sync. Yeah. There's no lip sync, uh, but also, you know, sound is, is, is very flexible. I mean, animation is pinned down, you know, often months or almost they, some things, shots are done many, many months in advance, really can't be changed without serious consequences. But sound, we could change. And so during the mix of the film, obviously lots of changes were made. I mean, the biggest uh, is that uh, you, you bring in the music, the final music for the first time, Thomas Newman's score. And, and lots of times then, now you've got all the real instruments, you've got all the sound effects and voices, and sometimes things don't work or they don't feel right. And there a, has to be a continual process of subtracting and trial and error and changing and recutting until it's all, you know, Andrew meticulously went through every sound, <laughs> every note, uh, pretty much, you know, satisfying himself that this was telling the story he wanted or it had the feeling that he wanted. 20 seconds to self-destruct. <laughs> 10 seconds to self-destruct. <laughs> We consider the storyboard process, or what we call the reels process, uh, another phase of writing. So it doesn't mean the writing is done. Um, and so we'll watch it cut and edited like a movie, just these storyboards with you know, our voices and scratch music from CDs and stuff. And we will go over that again and again and again and redo it because pencil and paper is very cheap. And uh, it's less expensive to change your mind, and you can do it again and again. And so um, that was pretty much, in shorts, usually that's the world it lives in. It, it rarely has a, has a script that it starts from. I wanted so badly to capture what it was like to go to the movies in the 70s and, and see, like, for me, it felt like it was a promise every year there was going to be another cool movie that brought you to space, whether it was Close Encounters or Star Trek or Alien or even Outland or, you know, uh, Blade Runner, you know, it just, uh, they just kept coming and suddenly it stopped for me and I just felt like, God, I want to go back there. I wanted to, here's a chance to do a sci-fi movie and I just want to capture that same wonder. And so I remember saying to my crew, I said, I want it to feel like you found Wally in a film can and it was made in the 70s and we just discovered it and we just restored it. And so that's a, that's a, that's a really, you know, evocative directorial kind of thing to say and say, well, how do you turn that into a practical application? And we said, well, what if we actually tried to mimic the same kind of cameras and lens packages that were predominantly used during the mid to early 70s? And we actually did our homework and figured that out. And I had always had this thing that annoyed the heck out of me for a lot of the um, 
Pixar movies, I just felt like the, that the physics of what was happening when we would rack focus or, 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 or have a shallow depth of field wasn't, wasn't doing exactly what I see cameras do in live action films. And I, and I just wanted that same exact grammar. And I don't know um, how many of you guys are in the, in the industry or worked with um, technical guys, but um, we'd go to them and go, you know what, I don't think it's doing what it's supposed to. And they would go, type, 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 type. nope, the math's all right. It's doing exactly the right thing. And which I read immediately after working for 15 years, like they don't want to do anything about it. Right? <laughs> And it was like, no, I really think it's not working. Like, no, math's right. And then, you know, there's the wall is there. And so what we did is we got, um, uh, I think it was a, either a Panavision camera, um, 70 millimeter, and a, and a live action crew. And we, um, we did a live action shoot on, on, in the middle of the night on the, at the atrium of Pixar and made these styrofoam scale levels of Wally and Eve and um, grid it, put a sort of tape grid on the whole floor, and we just shot all these different um, setups and did different racks and, uh, and, and everything we could think of. And then we had the same scale set built virtually with the uh, CG version of these characters and did the same thing with the virtual lenses that apparently were the math was all correct, supposed to be working right, and they didn't match at all. And so we had proof to go to the guys and go, you know, it doesn't work. And, here, and here's the proof, and that, they can't, you know, sleep. It's like the pee under the mattress. They just go, oh my gosh, it's wrong. And, and, they, and they had to go fix it. And, um, and, and, and it's, it's funny, I don't expect anybody to notice it, but I feel it. I, I just feel like it's just one more level of uh, familiarity for you as an audience member watching the movie that you're used to all these movies you've watched your whole life of just what's happening when we, when we uh, move the camera in or rack focus or push in or use a different lens. It, it, it's just slightly more comfortable shoes. And I, and I, I want to believe that it's contributing to the overall effect of you thinking that we're really there, that, there's, that your, your unconscious mind has gone to the, to the belief that there really is possibly a cameraman there right now shooting this. And, uh, and I just thought, again, that would all help in the ultimate goal of Wally being uh, charming, that much more charming when he comes to life. Oh! <gasps>